Welcome everybody to the Synapse Philosophy Group. I'm your Hague, your Hague. I'm your host, Hague John, and uh, we've got a got a, a really good section here from Dr. D.D. Palmer, his 1914 book, The Chiropractor, from page 33. Great place to start. Perfect chiropractic number: Health, Disease, Life, and Death. And uh, what a great chapter. Um, I just want to start off with the rules, and uh, it's not necessarily rules, but I was I, I spent my early chiropractic life in, with Pasquale Sarasoli at Self Center, so we have Self Center rules basically. Um, everyone has a chance to share. Okay, this is an open forum and discussion. If you want to get more uh, understanding of the passage we just read, ask questions. If you have something to share, share it, and uh, no attacking anyone. Right, this is all here for us to grow. Everyone has uh, has opportunities to learn, and that's what this is all about, okay? And so we might have some students come in and out. They sometimes get in from uh, Mexico, Brazil, and uh, in Europe. They listen a lot because later on, we record this and we put it on the uh, podcast on, uh, on Spotify and on YouTube. And uh, the other thing is kind of be brief. This is a discussion. Get to, uh, you know, and concise. Let's get to our point so we can discuss more. Oh, here's Steve Shargell is joining us. And uh, let's all have fun. I mean, this is all about growing, learning more about chiropractic so we can serve others at our absolute best. So we have a, a really good group tonight. I'm stoked to have everyone here. And uh, Simon Sensen, I'm so stoked to have you here. One of our authorities on uh, the Green Books who wrote the definitive guide to the Green Books, um, which absolutely is amazing and authored other books in chiropractic too. A true blessing for us all in chiropractic and for humanity because it's the people that deserve chiropractic care. Welcome and welcome everybody else. Thank you. All right. Well, what we do is we start off, we do a little bit of reading. And uh, this first, set, you know, we read and usually there's some meat from Dee Dee and then we pause and we discuss it. OK, and forgive me, I'm going to be uh, letting some people in. So I'll be back and forth to the computer, but I'm going to start reading and maybe we'll hand it off a little bit. OK, what do scientists, philosophers uh, and divines know of life and death? What knowledge have you of the relationship a relation existing between intelligence and material, spirit and matter. Is not death an incident of life? I mean, it's a big question right there. He's starting off with a bang in this paragraph. What would anybody get from that? Any clarity or uh, anybody like to express anything about it? What's the last sentence? Hey, could you repeat the last sentence? Yes. He said, uh, is not death an incident of life? The one before that is, what knowledge have you of the relation existing between intelligence and material, spirit and matter? Wow. I like the spiritual stuff because, you know, what he's really is asking intelligent men, who are the, the philosophers? What do you really know about spirit? What do you know about animating the material from above down and the inside out? What do you guys feel? Anything or should we keep reading? I think it's rich. I mean, this is really for him. It's the heart of chiropractic. It's the heart of the philosophy. What is life? You know, it's just so he's just kind of teasing you into the into his, you know, bigger question, which is, you know, for him, what it's all about. I mean, it does. He lays it out and it's like, okay. This the, this chapter is going to be pretty good. He's laying it out on the line right now, right? Yeah, the, the philosophy of chiropractic. What is life, disease, death, and eternal intelligence to intelligent existence? What force created this human organism? What is this intelligent vital agency? And from whence does it come? What of, of this int intellectual entity, which continues our existence as an intelligent living being? These questions have been propounded by savants of all ages. Chiropractors are able, at least in a great measure, to answer these very important questions. 
can we answer those questions coming out of school today? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> can chiropractors answer those questions? What do you guys feel? Is the answer an intellectual answer? Can the intellect answer for spirit? Can you put it into intellectual terms and our little educated brains can understand? Well, I, I like that. I think by framing it that chiropractors can answer this, he's, you know, he's putting it into the practical, which for him was the key, right? It was the philosophy was important, but for him, it was putting it into practice. So it's the chiropractors who get to see the expression of life every day in their patients and get to see the spirit coming through matter. So that's why chiropractors are in the unique position to really understand this because they're seeing the proof of it every day. I like that. Thank you for that. That's uh, that's enlightening. And uh, very cool. Anybody I, don't, else? I, don't, I have a question. How do chiropractors oh. see it differently than anybody else that witnesses a squirrel climbing up a tree? Good question. How many people are paying attention to that squirrel going up a tree the same way a chiropractor is paying attention to, you know, a toggle recoil or something? I mean, maybe some of them are. I guess it depends. Well, I think that's a very good point. And, you know, not many people realize they have even a, an innate intelligence. They don't realize that, the, the, I mean, they've been programmed something different into them. And, uh, you know, this didn't start today. Today, I posted just a video of the allegory of the cave, really. And, you know, going back to Plato, like, what are we seeing as an illusion? What is reality? And, you know, chiropractors, we've been given a gift, really, to be able to scratch below the surface to see what that reality is. And, and but really is be we're more aware, I would think I would say better. Awesome. Good discussion is what, about, what it's about. Um, I just got a message from Alan Lichter. He's trying to get in, but uh, that's what happens when you get a new computer. He's got it one more time. Hold on. There he is. Okay. My ideas concerning health, disease, life, and death have been greatly modified by years of careful research. I think in those days, for what Didi was, was writing in those things, he seemed like he was the most learned man about human physiology at the time. What would you say about that, Simon? You've done a lot of work in his history, you know, in his past. Hey, Alan, you made it. Good job. I keep working right. computer. Thank you. Great to see you, Alan. Hey, Simon. Yeah, man. Yeah, well, you know, I like it. This passage is really cool because, you know, the second part of this chapter, a lot of it, he's he's citing literature to back up his thesis he kind of like lays out the thesis in the first few paragraphs there kind of his main idea yeah and then and then he gives us all these references which which goes to your point of how learned he was you know one of my favorite um history papers in the literature it came out in the 90s and the main author was um gaucher percherby who um, few people realize he wrote a book on early chiropractic, or, which was actually his P part of his PhD thesis that was translated from French into English. And his PhD was done in France at this prestigious medical history program. So he looked at Dee Dee Palmer's work in the context of the history of medical um, thinking so one thing in that particular paper, he was able to show that the references that D.D. D. Palmer used in his 1910 book, like the medical textbooks he was referencing, they compared those. They took the whole list of all the books he was referencing, and they compared those to what your average medical student was required to read at medical school within a hundred miles of D.D. Wow. Palmer of Davenport at that time. And they found that not only was D.D. Palmer up on the latest literature, but he was able to go back sometimes 200 years in some of the editions and wow. be able to cite 
what was different. So he was way ahead of your average medical doctor. And you can see that just, I know I'm jumping ahead, but I noticed that okay. like on one of the next pages, he says, here's a book from 1716. Here's another book. The middle from, of 34. Yeah, on page 34. And then on the next page or so, he says, um, I think there was another one. Maybe it wasn't in this article, but it was something from 1631. I mean, one from 1776 at the bottom of 34. Yeah, Baron right. von Weizen, you know? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, right. Right. So, I mean, he was in his library. He's, oh, yeah. And the, at, the, at the end, at the bottom of page 33, that's where I saw it. He says, this one is from 1694. He's got a book on his on his shelf. And you have to think about that in context. So he, you've seen those pictures of him. Um, there's this one classic picture of him with his wife in um, when they lived in Oregon. So that was around 1908, 1909, maybe 1910. So he had to ship all of his books when he moved from Oklahoma because he basically left Davenport with whatever books he could carry when he left in 1906 moved down to Oklahoma for a couple of years and then moved to Oregon. And the photo of him in Oregon, he's still got this full bookshelf of all these old tomes. And then when he wrote this, when he wrote these essays for 1914, he had moved again in 1911. Now he was in Southern California. So for him to say, I'm pulling this 1694 book off my shelf, you got to know he, he, he probably carted that thing and some trunks on a train across the United States and then down the coast to California for years. So, I mean, wow. he was really, really invested in his learning and in really understanding, you know, that not just the spiritual physical, but he really wanted to understand the physiology and the anatomy so, so they they found he was most well read in, in anatomy, physiology, and surgery textbooks because the surgery books were the most articulate about the spine. So the guy was amazing, really. Absolutely amazing. I mean, that's that's a good story. I, I actually didn't realize that. That's a lot of good insight. And you think about it, you know, if, if we think about it, he did it for us. And he did it for the people, the, the denizens of the earth. And uh, I mean, that's it's truly amazing because it's not like you run around with your, you know, your iPhone and look up something on Google to find some. This is this is the literature of the time. This is what you can get your hands on, you know, 1776, 16, whatever. I mean, this was well referenced, probably material of the day, you know, and yeah. uh, it's what they had, you know, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and, and one of Gal Sher's papers, actually, that few people have read, it's kind of hard to find, but he he called him, um, I'll have to look up the title, but he basically makes the, the claim that D.D. Palmer was understood the medical literature of the day to such an extent that he understood where the gaps were in medical literature and what they were missing and he actually filled those gaps with his concept of tone and his subluxation model. So it's really cool stuff that, you know, reframes, you know, what, what he really contributed. Is it hard to find that paper? I'd really like to read that. Yeah, I've got it somewhere. I'll, I'll hook you up with it for sure. It was published in the Journal of European Chiropractic in the early 90s. Okay. So okay, I'll pull it out for you. That is awesome. I, I love hearing that because, uh, you know, he was a, he was on the cutting edge. He really was. That's amazing. Thanks for yeah. sharing that. What, sure. what, what I'm thinking is really skip a little bit. Just like you said, we've got a lot of references or would you guys just like to read all the way through it? Anybody? Because the references are referencing books. We can just continue to read. Yeah, I think this page really gives you the heart of his ideas okay. here. So I think it's good. Yeah, absolutely. So the nerves, that's where I left off, right? No, health is a condition. Health is a condition of the body in which all the functions are performed in a usual manner. Impulses forwarded over the nervous system at the usual rate, giving the proper force to the rebound, reflex action in parentheses, as the re renitent tissue, all acts being performed in a normal degree. 
uh, whoever I bought this from, you know, he had this all underlined. And, uh, you know, that's a powerful statement to use. Go ahead, Dwayne. Yeah, I've been uh, preaching this for the last couple of years that you think of every medical miracle ever done, including the, the, the physical healing that Jesus did, is returning the body to a normal state. Yeah. And that's what that's he's right. talking about here. When the body is normal, it's the best it possibly can be. Perfectly said. You know, you ask 10 chiropractors what the definition of health is. Mostly people are, uh, you know, you know, they quote the World Health Organization, like an old definition. Um, but, you know, he lays it right out here for us. It makes perfect sense and it's easy. What do you guys think? All right. The nerve system. On, the nervous system. Si I Go saw ahead. Simon writing that down. I better get reference for that if you use it. <laughs> Always. And Always. next Friday, I get three more letters after my name. So make sure ACP goes on there. Oh, good for you. Hey, I'll be on campus Friday. I'll be on in the morning. I'll, I'll be on the lookout for you. All right, man. I look forward to seeing you. Anyway, sorry to interrupt that, but I want to make sure I get cited. Yeah, yeah. Well, congratulations, Dwayne. That is awesome. You get you, the PHC, you're finishing the program. You're, is that what that well, was? Sherman, Sherman has a new program they just started. It's called the Diplomat ACP. So they're going with the DACP, and it's all going to be within Sherman. Very cool. Awesome. But this awesome. is the first one, the ACP, the Academy of Chiropractic okay. Philosophers. Excellent. Sorry, I didn't mean to take over, but I wanted to make sure I got cited. You know, it's all about chiropractic. We're talking about chiropractic. That's good. I like it. I like it. Okay. The, nerves, the nervous system is the line of communication of our thoughts. Impulses in parentheses. Impulses are not fluids which flow. When the nervous tissue is normal in its structure, tension, firmness, and renitency have the degree of tone, the transference of thought, commands, impulses are the normal are, are of normal force, the result of health. It's a mouthful, a lot of commas there. What was that about the flow? You know, that thoughts do not flow. Is that what I heard you read? Impulses are not fluids which flow. What are they? He's not talking about necessarily mental impulses here. Well, he didn't like BJ. If, if, correct me if I'm wrong. BJ using the word mental impulse. He liked vital forces. You know, it's not a fluid where we're really, you know, the, the, the kink in the water hose, right? It's so much more than that. Life is bigger than that. I really oh, feel expressed. Does flow mean from point A to point B in in locality? Because, or is it more like the phenomenon of waves, where the most of the things are going up and down, like the, the bobber? And the, I mean, what is this thing that gets transmission? What is this transmission? If, is is it motion or is it something else? Well, what you were just doing was making a wavelength, right? With a certain order, an impulse, right? With a certain tone and vibration. Yeah, I think he, he part of this was kind of grew out of his debate with BJ Palmer at the time because BJ had just recently unveiled his whole model of the normal complete cycle, the safety pin cycle, and BJ used that language of the mental impulse flowing over the nerves. So this is one of DD's Dee Dee, distinctions to tell BJ you're wrong and this is actually the right way to describe it. And, you know, and that's why he called the book The Chiropractor's Adjuster, mostly to adjust those misconceptions of especially BJ. So part of it, I think, was just nitpicky, you know, just I want to be right. But other parts, he really, he used it as a way to expand his own insights. I mean, what we've got in these first few paragraphs, I, I think of this really as D.D. Palmer's paradigm right here. This is the this is the heart of his whole model of chiropractic, because you've got his. Because for me, a paradigm is really three things. It's it's a worldview. So his worldview was that intelligence and matter, spirit and matter, were linked, 
And his his theory was that these were linked through the nervous system and they could be interfered with with the subluxation. And then the practice was the adjustment and the expression of life afterwards or the normal expression of matter, of intelligence, spirit through matter. So so this is really, I mean, I feel like besides the moral and the moral stuff at the beginning, the moral and religious duty in the beginning of this book, you could take that and take this section right here and you got the whole essence of his final thoughts. It's really great. Where I, get, where I get stuck, I love the basis of the link of intelligence and matter, spirit and matter. But I get stuck when I try to mecha mechanistically understand it. How does spirit grip matter? is something that I want to be able to put it in mathematic or, you know, linear terms and, and perhaps. That's your problem. That's my problem. <laughs> I don't exactly. That's, and that is, that it is may not fit that model. Huh? Spirit may not fit that model. Exactly. <laughs> and you know what? Uh, Stevenson uses that same language. He says, this is how it grips. And his metaphor is a magnetic field. So, you know, there's some sort of energetic component here of linking things together, that magnetism, that, you know, that kind of cool stuff. You know, just going back to what you said before, Simon, about BJ and uh, Dwayne, just one second. And is I don't think there's any, uh, the, it's not a mistake that this is page 33. And uh, the the normal complete cycle, and they're working the 33 principles at that time. Do you think, maybe I, mean, I, I think DD and BJ were writing things in code at time too. So, Dwayne, go ahead. Yeah, when was the Schmarl's nodes and the jumping of the electrons on the nerves, when was that discovered? Uh, yeah, Sherrington was right around this time, like 1906 or so. I don't know about the Schmarl's nodes. Yeah, so, I mean, this is like even before science knew about the the nerve nerve messages jumping between nodes, not the flow of the axoplasmic fluid. He's even talking about this before science discovered it. Yeah. So disease has always been considered and treated as an entity, a being with intelligence, one of which could be talked to, commanded to go at our bidding. The body treated in treated in such a manner with drugs and incantations so so as to make it uncomfortable for its inhabitation. Disease is a condition. I just said this in my office today, really. We're not the victims of our disease. This that's it's not happening to us. It's not an entity. It's from us. And uh, you know, disease is a condition I have underlined by the guy who had this in 1950. Even worse than that is when we make the disease our identity. That's right. That's yeah. right. That's a it's a badge of honor and badge of communication with people. You know, you know, um, Harper's book. He it, it's called "Anything Can Cause Anything," and Harper. He, oh, you've got a copy. That's a rare one there. And yeah. he's oh, the blue one. Yeah, yep, yeah. yeah. He 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 says across that crest right there on the on the front, "Health is the entity." Yeah, you know, and that's and that was after studying D.D. Yeah. D. Palmer for ten years. Then he wrote the book. So he was trying to capture the essence right there. And that's a, a distinction, I think, between the chiropractic paradigm and the medical paradigm, where health is the entity, which is a whole nother way of thinking. Yeah, it's, a, it's the, uh, uh, the Pasteur, you know, uh, th uh, you know, it's Pasteurism, really. Yeah, right, right. Okay, the next one, he says, uh, we are learning to think aright. Instead of a fearful 
reverence for irrational superstition. We are learning to reason along biological lines. He's like, I'm smartening this up. What he's doing is saying, we're changing the world. And that's it. We've got to start thinking more clearly. I mean, it's still an uphill battle. But, uh, you know, that I feel like he's saying, come on, we've got work to do. What do you guys feel? It's a power statement. I really, yeah. this, I feel this whole book really is DD saying you got to pull up your bootstraps. You got to get, tell the people that about chiropractic and you got to get out there and start saving lives. If it's not your religious duty, make it your moral duty and get out there and tell the truth. This is my favorite book. I absolutely love it. But uh, this is what he's thinking. We're learning to think, we're, we think a right is, is we're straightening us ourselves and everybody else out. It's a powerful uh, sentence right there. Well, yeah, speaking, no, whole, oh, sorry, yeah, go sorry. ahead, Dwayne. Yeah, go ahead. In speaking, there's there's three parts to every speech. You're going to tell them what you're going to tell them. You're going to have some sort of hook to keep them. Uh, then you're going to tell them, and then you're going to tell them what you told them. So this is the hook. This is getting people's attention. The next paragraph sets the hook, and then it goes into the meat of, I'm going to give you examples from these old books of the former, which is the irrational superstition, and they all happen to be medical books. So That's this right. is a setup for for what he's really going to be getting at here in the next couple paragraphs. Very cool. Yeah. Thanks for that. It's very insightful. Absolutely. Yeah, and the heart of that um, biological thinking, you know, that's really, um, you know, that's the other real piece, the, the, the unique distinction of chiropractic and the process of healing that takes time, the process of restoration. The idea was that disease is a logical process that happens in a sequence. And in his mind, starting with the subluxation, you know, what we would think of today as a, a pathophysiological cascade, right, leading to uh, like a neurodystrophic process leading to, um, uh, you know, the breakdown and the disease process. And then after the adjustment, there's a logical progression towards health, which is where retracing comes in, which is where the body goes through the steps back towards health. So for him, disease was something logical rather than something that was magical that you had to zap out of the body. It was something that you could understand, oh, this disease relates to this vertebra, putting pressure on this nerve, that's logical. And let's retrace it and restore it and let health be expressed. So it was just a whole different way of thinking, really. But it was for him, it was so logical because it was following biology. Simon, so, think, what would be what would DD DD would DD think that you can be healthy and then die? He says it here. Isn't is not death an incident of life? We can't cheat. You know what we're a lot of times this this you know a uh, uh, disease chasing is we're trying right. to you know fight death. But right, it focuses on function, which is what we we're just talking about. Things stop functioning when you die, or you die because of things stop functioning. So is death natural, or is it a? Are we what? What did he say about? That? natural death other than it's it's a natural substance but what about regarding this thing we're talking about health and dis disease where does death come in or how is that viewed it's the ultimate uh limitations of matter really <laughs> yeah i love it you know the reclaiming of energy is ultimately it uh, that's it's a it, limitation it, of matter, limitation it, is, yeah. it is it is that limitation of energy and matter because here's the magnetic healer becoming chiropractor because dd states health is a condition he also states disease is a condition and like simon was saying there's a roadmap to either one so if there's always you're always in a condition you're always in a state <laughs> fantastic anybody else alan uh -huh. 
Yeah, I mean, chiropractors, they don't really say it much anymore, but the, the philosophical way of describing death was always, that's when they stopped adapting. Mm. You know, cool. you still see it once in a while, people will write that you'll see something like that on Facebook, but it used to be a common phrase in chiropractic, especially from the Palmer School. You know, when the body ceases adapting, that's just that that's the natural thing that happens. I just wrote that down. Make sure we remember that one. Yeah, it is. Wow. And so, <laughs> Steve, if you remember last year, too, Dee was talking about whenever death occurs, are we reaching our higher level of transformation of our spirit? Our spirit's always improving always doing better for the universe and whenever that that time that transitions there that's a tr that's a transformative transition of our spirit it's done our job in this body on this planet and dd dd have talked about that moving that spirit moving that universe ahead moving the whole tone of all the nervous systems as a community as an individual together at, uh, to the highest level of spirituality that we can get I love that. Yeah. Well, that doesn't sound like a limitation of matter. You're talking about a... Uh, <clears throat> well, that's the unlimited spirit. That's an ID. Uh, Barry Hobbs, my ID right now is my ID. When my spirit moves on, it's going to be something else, and I'm not worried about that. It's under universal intelligent control. Kind of like the radio station behind you, right? The frequency... You, you got the radio background. You're just tuning into the barrier frequency right now. I, I like how the, the center point right there, it's just right over your head, man. It, you look inspired. I love it. I love it. The All right, I'm going to read the next one. In order the to broadcast TV continues, but the TV malfunctions and is no longer <laughs> transmitting. Uh, Okay, in order to give you an idea of advancement in correct reasoning, the difference between superstition and rationalism, I will quote an illustration of the former for which the four old books I, from each of the four old books I have. All right, I'll go through those. What do you guys think? Yeah. Bates Dispensatory by William Salmon, professor of physics, date 1694, containing his choice and select recipes applicable to the whole practice of the psychic and what is that? Chi surgery. Physics and surgery. Surgery? That's a, surgery? a, that's a spelling for surgery, yeah. No, this is 1694 spelling. Ah. 1694 English spelling. Which, with above 500 chemical processes... Those so much famed in the world. On page 897, he gave the formula for the sympathetic ointment. For uh, sympathetic ointment for wounds. This prescription is preceded by the RX, which was then, as well as now, always placed at the at the commencement of a recipe. Dun Dun Dun. Dun Dunglison, excuse me, dictionary says that this RX originally, it, originally it was the sign of Jupiter and was placed at the top of a, excuse me, of a formula uh, to per, uh, propitiate the king of the gods. Propitiate and that, what is it? Oh, propitiate? It means to take the place of. Well, thank you very much. Maybe I'll read the next paragraph. <laughs> the, uh, the, good of the gods that the compound might set favorably. Jupiter was Ju an ancient Italian god of the heavens. That was the next paragraph. You can go down. <laughs> and then continue. Okay. The compound was made of, quote, oil of roses, linseed oil, man's grease, not even going to go there, moss <laughs> of a man's skull, Killed by a violent death in powder, mummy, yes, yes. man's blood, mix and make an ointment. By this ointment, all wounds are healed. Anointing the instrument by which the wound was made once a day, every day, if the wound be great. Otherwise, 
If the wound be small, once every second or third day may suffice. The weapon is to be kept wrapped up in a clean linen cloth and in a place not too hot that the patient suffers thereby. Physicians of the past and present in selecting portions of humans or animals always take those of the male as they are supposed to make stronger drugs than those of the females. They chose those who had met violent death for the reason that those dying of disease would sow the germs of destruction. They treated the instrument as the producer and repairer. The London Dispensatory, date 1716, on page 169, gives a valuable quote or question mark recipe. Quote, the hair of the patient made into a powder and drank cures the jaundice. The ashes of it mixed with hog's lard as an ointment helps luxated joints. The simple ashes stop bleeding. An oil distilled from it with honey anointed on bald places causes hair to grow. There you go, Simon. The thing I wasn't going to say a thing. <laughs> the fingernails of the patient made into a powder or infusion cause vomiting, great sickness at the stomach, and giddiness in the head. The powder laid to the navel and dropsies is said to cure them. To cure consumption, take the hair and nails of the patient, cut them small, put them in a, in a hole in the root of a cherry tree, and then stop it with clay. To cure quartons or fevers, and the gout, take the said hair and nails, cut small, and either give them to birds in a roasted egg, or put them into a whole board into the body of an oak tree, not cherry, but oak, or else mix them with wax and stitch it to a live crab, cast it again into the river again, end quote. And that's from 1716. Let's pause there just for a moment. That's <laughs> a mouthful. You know, and, and that's a fun stuff, you know. He's put that in there for a reason, and uh, that's... Uh, you know, 1600s, if you know, if you plant a cherry pit, you know, whatever, with some toenail clippings. And, you know, he's poking fun, I, I feel. Simon, I have a question for you, and I just thought of it while he was reading. In no, volume it's not about ointments or anything. <laughs> no, it's all about ointments, yes. Hair ointments and everything. No, in volume 39, we just read that one and finished it recently. He talked about, we've proven that a man sleeping north to south sleeps better and i thought where in the world i did not read that anywhere besides oh, a volume yeah. nine. did they do a research somewhere in that bj yeah yeah you got to read the known man you know that one um, yeah i've read the known man. maybe i just missed over that part yeah 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 the known man and and i i published a bit about this and um i put out a paper years ago in chiropractic history okay. um it's called chiropractic and energy medicine, uh, something like that. And where I, I looked at a lot of that research. So, you know, they had the, the shielded grounded booths. And for the people who don't know, BJ Palmer started his own research clinic in the 1930s. And it was just a massive enterprise. It was, it was built to rival the Mayo Clinic for chiropractic. Um, they had this whole instrumentation area where they wanted to bj wanted to study the human organism and he wanted to study the energies of the human organism apart from the environment as best he could so he built these shielded grounded booths basically a faraday cage and um so it was surrounded by copper wiring all of the wires going in were also shielded and grounded um when the patients came in they were greeted with someone who was wearing rubber boots and the person would shake their hand to dissipate the static energy from the patient who came in from the environment and then they would do these experiments mostly using thermography instrumentation but they also, you know, did the whole tympograph research. But with thermography, what they wanted to see was 
how was the organism being affected by the environment? So one thing they did, because they had the radio station, which you can see in Barry's backdrop there, on the roof of the building, right? The roof of the school had this huge radio station. So when they heard static coming through the speakers in the hallways, they knew there was some static electricity in the atmosphere. So that was one experiment they did where they took patients out of the booth and graph them in the hallway to see what the graph reading was. And then they put them in the booth and closed the door and graph them in there to see how the organism was having a different pattern when it was being affected by the electromagnetic frequencies. And then another study they did was they, they had someone sleep. And I think with this one, they probably used the tympograph because they would hook people up this was the neuroencephalomental tympograph, yeah. <laughs> and this was basically it was early EEG technology, and BJ had the engineers develop pinpoint pads. So instead of a big EEG pad like you would put on someone's head, he had these pinpoints because he wanted to detect the individual mental impulse. So they had eight leads all the way through someone's spine from the head down to the legs and then back the other side because he wanted to detect the flow of the mental impulse and where it got blocked from a subluxation or interfered with. So they had people sleep with their heads north and south and they did continuous readings while they were sleeping. And according to BJ, it, it took 70 or 80% less energy to sleep with your head pointed north because you were aligned with the magnetic frequency. And he said the only thing that we weren't able to keep out was like cosmic rays or something. It's, it's a pretty cool book to read that the known man, you really yeah. get a good sense of what he was doing. I see Barry's got one there. Oh, probably an original Barry's barry's got the collection oh there you go bj's research yeah yeah nice yeah, i've got i've got a couple of those yeah i was nice. gonna say if people want to see the pictures that he's talking about these clinic books volume 20 and a couple of the others are great photos great information on the electro and cephalo neuromantipograph and all the other instruments and volume 19 is phenomenal the known man as well yep yeah and, yeah as you mentioned, volume 20, it's one of my favorites. So it's, you know, it's all laid out, the research right there. And it's it's kind of an obscure book now, which uh, people don't have it. I think they did a reprint uh, much smaller than the original, though. But yeah, thank you for all that. Good. Anybody else? Well, should we, does somebody want to read some more of this mouthful over here? Or uh, Dwayne, you're doing a great job. Where are we? The London Dispensary, is that it? Date 1776? Or are we up here at Jupiter? You want me to? I'll, yeah, go I'll ahead. Go yeah, actually, I'm down a little bit further than that. So we already talked about casting, um, putting stuff in wax, stitching it to a live crab, and then casting it into the river. Oh, yeah, there's the... Okay, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, the above, yeah. Yeah, so the above while relieving, question mark, the patient of the evil was hard on the trees, crabs, and birds. <laughs> The people of Europe and America are making foolish pother over Friedman's serum evolved from a turtle as a cure of tuberculosis. I recall from I recall to memory brown sea curds of the girl of life. Dr. Koch's consumption theorem. Koch had found the wiggler and the dope that would stop this wiggling. The above are but the survival of the old superstition, quote, the hair of the dog that bit you will heal the wound, end quote which I think is referring to the old wives' tale. Yeah. In 1776, Baron von Sweden, counselor and first physician to their majesties, the emperor and empress of Germany, perpetual president of the College of Physicians in Vienna, member of the Royal Academy of Science and Surgery at Paris, honorary fellow of the Royal College of Physicians at Edinburgh, published a book. On page 37, he says... A pleurisy terminates either in a cure, in other diseases, or in death. This is a circumstance which, this is a circumstance which a pleurisy has in common with all other diseases. End quote. The Baron had made a wonderful discovery that persons affected with disease either get well or died, unless their <laughs> affections ended in some other disease. 
Samuel Frieden Gray published a treatise on pharmacology in 1824. On page 159, he says, in a medical or chemical point of view, animals are inferior in rank to vegetables, as neither affording remedies of such power nor consisting of so many distinct principles as the latter. There is even reason to suppose that most of the virtues attributed to animal substances are imaginary, and that their apparent effects ought to be ascribed to the other substances exhibited in them. In general, we only mention those substances which are or rather have been kept in the shops. Human skull, cranium hominis. The powder is used in epilepsy. Those which have been long buried are to be preferred. <laughs> and some even limit the effect to that triangular bone called the os triquetrium. Uh, os triangular cuneiform bone of the wrist. Age and distance lend, lend enchantment to superstition. <laughs> I hope I put enough sarcasm in the reading of that to to <laughs> mimic what he may have been writing as he wrote it. Jolly good show. Absolutely. And you could feel DD exactly what you're saying. It's you know, it's he's mocking them really, right? All right. Yeah, I think, I think he like I think he really liked to use this kind of stuff as just pretty much all of his references and all of his critiques of people, he just he used them as a way to just bounce off and talk about, refine his ideas, really like just give people the goods, you know. So to me, this it's like it's just weird stuff to read. But when it's you get to the stuff. back page, when you get to page 36, that's when he's like, all right, so this is disease. This is normal health. This is my theory. Life is intelligent action. You know, for me, that's the good stuff. I well, mean, when I read it, I get to, right? Yeah yeah. 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 I mean, you got to, if you want to slog through the pages to get there, but you kind of get the gist right, yeah. from we're almost, we're almost there. That's what I was saying. We could skip a little bit. I mean, it's it, it's it's tongue in cheek, the other stuff. And, uh, you know, that's why he's putting it in there. And, and in a way, you know, that's where they're calling us. They've said, you know, call this quacks, but look where the quackery has come from, you know. And uh, so that's I feel I'm just it's the right left jab, you know, that come yeah, on. Yeah. So then, so, well, the next paragraph, he starts to come back. He starts to come around to that. Mm -hmm. Well, Alan, you want to you want to pick it up at uh, sure. The next page of the beginning of 36. What do you guys think? Now that I finally have my mic working. <laughs> there you go. I missed you. I haven't heard your voice all night. Hundreds of scientists are devoting their lives to the study of bacteriology, germ investigation, a, micro, a microscopical branch of biology in order to determine their relation to health and disease, not realizing that life action is due to the combination of intelligence and matter spirit manifestation through material and there it is he's come back yeah. around to say all that other stuff not so much right it's spirit and body that are making it all happen here yeah 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 and and i think that's one of the things that really made him stand out from even the other magnetic healers there were lots of theories you know about intelligence and consciousness and healing i mean that was that was in vogue at that time he wasn't really unique in a lot of that his real uniqueness was to say the pathway of this is the nervous system and that can be interfered with i mean that was a contribution that nobody had really said quite so clearly so it's i think it's crucial to get that link and that that was the key for him right what linked them together the spirit and the matter and that was the vital force, what he called the soul, which was the vital force flowing through the body. That was his his term was that that's that's a term for the soul. Other people might take issue with using the term soul, but but for him, the soul was the intelligent life in the body. And that was the bridge between the spirit and the matter. Mm. Thanks for that clarity. Yeah, uh, I think it's one of the most important parts of chiropractic. It's what it's based on. And really what we're seeing is that's being pushed out of the education itself. And that's why we do these things, these, these podcasts and your books and all these things is how important it is to get it to the generations of chiropractors after us. 
Yeah. I mean, has anybody else seen that? I mean, because if we take God out or spirit out of the out of the equation, and you know, Dee Dee said that uh, people aren't ready to hear spirit and God, so we're going to use innate and uh, universal. And uh, you know, he uses, you know, he doesn't say innate very often. He usually uses, I seem spirit. Would you agree? Um, but I think it's one of the the most important portion portions of our philosophy of what we do and why we do it. You want to continue, Alan? Sure. The isopathic theory and system of treatment of disease by means of a, the causal agent, that it is possible to cure a disease by means of a virus of the same disease. Also, the treatment of diseased organ, that the abnormal functions may be returned to normal by an extract of the same organ from a healthy animal, the curing of diseased organ by eating the analogous organ of a healthy animal, savers of cannibalistic barbarism, eating an enemy transfers his fighting qualities to the devourer. You see the heart of their enemy, right? Give them this, the strength of, the, of, the, of their opponents. Yeah. Uh, the explanation of this natural immunity is still uncertain. All the phenomena of immunity have not been satisfactorily explained. Medical men who believe in this dogma think natural immunity hereditary, that Don's ancestors are immunized as a result of being infected, the immunity being transmitted to their descendants. Quote, but little is known regarding these the antitoxins, unquote. The theory is the serum of one animal when inducted into the blood of another may destroy or modify the form, nature, and structure of the red corpuscles, unquote. Uh, then a separate quote, the wonderful protective adaptation of the body toward the invasion of the foreign cells, the nature of the processes involved is not <clears throat> at all understood. The phenomena is therefore designated provisionally as a biological reaction. By referring to Donglison's medical dictionary, date 1903, page 1100, you will find that animal extractions are yet in vogue. Disease consists of a change in structure, position, or function. Disease is a disturbed condition, functions performed abnormally in too great a degree or not enough. It is not something foreign to the body, which by some means alters it, enters it, sorry. It is not a thing of enmity which we have to fight. Disease does not involve any new functional expression which did not already, it did not already possess. Disease is a manifestation of too much or not enough energy. Energy is liberated force in living being. It is known as, a, as vital force. Is that the first time he mentions that? I don't think so, but it's, okay. it's, it's definitely the key. And, and that's yeah, really it's right there. He's, he's yeah, putting it right 19, out there. And he uses it a lot, but in this section, he, this is the first time he's saying it for sure. Yeah. 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 And it's really, and that's the other, that's his model, right? And I, I always stress that when I teach students, the, when, and, because a lot of people don't differentiate BJ's model and DD's model. And mm -hmm. DD's model was really that they're, there can be too much or not enough functioning as a result of the disturbance or the irritation to the nervous system, where BJ leaned more on the sort of cutting off of the flow and not enough going to the organ systems, where DD was really clear that you can't really state which what's going to happen. It could go up, it could go down, that's, which is both dis-ease, right? Yeah, I like that. I'm taking notes either way up and down, <laughs> which is disease, dis hyphen ease, right? Yeah, yeah. What if go on from there? A normal amount of energy released from released from that which is stored results in health. The amount of energy stored for future use depends upon the condition of the organ as a storage receptacle. Disease is the result of releasing too much or not enough stored energy. Energy is the latent power or force of an force in an organ, which when released creates action. 
energy is aroused by a motor impulse. If the impulse in, is normal in force, then the normal amount of energy is expended. Disease is abnormal functioning, not enough or too much action, too much or not enough life. Life consists of intelligent action. Disease is morbid tissue and abnormal functioning. The quality of tissue and the amount of functioning is are coexistent. In all diseases, we find an excess of or a diminished amount of energy force expended. Should I keep going to finish this up and then talk? Or we, yeah, let's go. Talk there? Okay. In one lesson, I cannot fully cover the cause of disease as it takes a large amount of chiropractic education in principles and facts regarding the science of biology. Abnormal structure cannot do otherwise than be the creator of disease. Disease is, death is natural. Steve, you still here? Oh. Death is natural. Whether of the physiological or a pathological nature, it is a natural result, a natural change. All laws are of nature natural. What is it? What is that which is present in the living body and absent in dead? It is the intelligent force, which I saw fit to name innate, usually known as spirit. It creates and continues life when the vital organs are in a condition to be acted upon by that intelligence. This All right. This concept is um, it's some serious stuff right here. Known as resilience factors or, um, I just lost it. It's part of my paper. It's uh, part of resilient storing up resiliency um, and a pool that you can draw from. Salutogenics has got this as one of its core concepts so another thing where we welcome the medical field to what we've been saying for over 100 years let now, me ask a question here if death is natural and it's a lack of adaptation it's a limitation of matter the ultimate but how is that different from disease well, he says death is natural, whether it's physiological or a pathological nature. So dis-ease would, would be a pathological cause. Physiological means he just ran out of gas. I'm going to ask a question. Now, he doesn't use the word subluxation very often. The description right here, abnormal structure cannot do otherwise than be the creator of disease, right? Right which is a, a definition of a, a subluxation in my mind. Would I be correct? What do you guys think? Why does BJ not use the word subluxation very often? DD? I mean, DD, excuse me. What do you guys, I, I, that was just one of my observations so far in this book. Well, maybe well, you he, jump I mean, from my question. I, I would like a response. I, I still don't understand if we are doing adjustments in order to remove interference to the life force and the problem is dis-ease and people die. Uh, the are, flesh is not meant to be immortal. The spirit is. How do we the reconcile death returned. and disease? I don't the know. The flesh that. needs to be returned into its energy and replenished in another way. Well, it's can not that be done? Can that be done through cancer in a natural way? Sounds logical to me. Doesn't fit. Well, why not? Because it's I look at it's. A, it's a, go it's ahead, a, Simon. Oh no, you go ahead. No, I'm done. Well, we're I'm not treating questions. Death. I'm just asking questions because. Well, well, this is the thing. If we were treating sickness and we're treating death, that's what we're focusing on. We're caring for the people. The word treatment, you know, that's for the for the invader. If we're looking at it in that sense, we're not treating death. We're not treating disease. We're caring for this person adjusting this bony frame to take nerve tension off the system. Is you know, a DD. I would, thought would we're I thought we're adjusting in order to increase adaptation ability. 
and and is disease a lack of adaptation? Is death also a lack of adaptation? There's we have to go back to there's a limitation of matter and the body may or may not be able to make a recovery from whatever damage may have been done over time, uh, whether and, and whether our adjustments are done effectively enough to help uh, to allow a correction innate to use that energy that we're putting in to allow a correction to occur and a response and a restoration of ease to occur. There may be limitations. We may not be able to put in a, a force that's, that's, that the body can use adequately. We, or, in, or maybe somebody gets hit by a bus and then they get, and it corrects the subluxation and they walk away, you know, better than they, than they, than before that there would be the same thing. The body, the innate, the body can't tell the difference between the force that you put in and something that, and something that happens randomly as they fell down. You know, somebody falls down and hits their head and they get their hearing back. It happens. You read about it in the paper. Sometimes. Okay. So death, death can be car. Death can also correspond to a state of ease. Let me tell you this. I've got a perfect yeah, it can happen yes. in a state of ease. Why not? Okay. Let me give you an example. I used to go to, to, uh, to, I still do go to nursing homes and, and some, you know, rehab centers and, and, and adjust people. And, uh, there was one woman, a medical doctor, he asked me to come in cause I adjust the staff and I adjust people. And he said, he brought me, he said, can you take care of this woman? And, let me tell you, she was screaming at the top of her lungs as loud as she could in full tetany for two years, he said. And I went, to, they left the room and I went and looked at her, her check her legs or do something. And they're like two big tree stumps with nails coming out of it like, a, a, you know, something from a horror movie. I put my hand in her atlas and I just uh, I walked out of the room. The next day I came, or two days later, I came back and they said, what in the world did you do? And I thought, oh my God, that killed her. I don't know what happened. Well, she went from just, just screaming and shouting obscenities at everyone. Okay. I did the same thing. She's calling me every name you could ever imagine. I went, ah, and I left. I did that again. She went from screaming obscenities to just anger and uh i came back the fourth time and she had passed realized i freed her the the the, the adjustment took her there she was in a prison and her spirit was able to be free i didn't take her life but what happened it was a few days after that adjustment from absolute torture this poor woman had been in for decades who knows what she'd lived through but then she was free. The adjustment truly is freedom. Freedom from you to be who you're meant to be, whether it's passing from this energetic plane to the next energetic plane, to be recycled of that material of us into the birds and the beautiful flowers and all the other things that robe this wonderful earth with the scents and hues. So, you know, it's not up to us. If someone goes, they're meant to go. I can't change that you can't either you have that time stamp somewhere on you no one knows where it is what we do is serve them clear them and we step away as sigafus used to say i move the bones the of our ability healing. you know and i have that in my wall because i can't heal you but if we're getting you know in death i think of that woman and, and that's happened more than once not screaming but where people were free and it's not only what we think of as now everybody's going to skip around and throw daisies in the air but it's truly is serving them so they can be the spirit they're meant to be. So that's my 17 cents. <laughs> you know, and it's it, the, we've all had people that have, that we've seen that you start to take care of them and they walk and some and they walk in and go, I didn't tell you about this, but it changed. What did you, you do? You know, yeah. it's well, all we're doing is you you don't expect I I didn't expect. They expect the symptoms to change. I go, what happens, happens. You know, the symptoms may get worse, they may get better, they may change, you know, and something entirely different that you don't expect may happen where you, you know. some other symptom goes away. Because if we can change the energy that's being transmitted within their body and allow it to flow more freely, then the body's going to try to make a correction and heal itself. And that's 
that's the purpose of what we're doing here. You know, and as far as the question of subluxation, that may be talking more about that it's a bony issue, and maybe there's other, you know, things that are being addressed when you're adjusting somebody. Sometimes you just talk to the, the start talking to the practice member, and you see their their body language change before you even put your hands on them. And sometimes you adjust them, and you and you step back, and all of a sudden they change. It's not. You know, the, the moment of the adjustment is when the body makes the change, not when you do it. And that's the confusion in our profession, thinking that the adjustment is what you do. It's really what the body does. We put the force in and the body makes the adjustment. The innate intelligence within makes the adjustment. Yeah. When we, we take credit for it, that's when it all falls apart. It's easier to explain to people if you say, I adjusted you. It's harder to explain the other part. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's where the education fails. And you're right about yeah. that because they're afraid to teach it. And uh and okay. oh, yeah. afraid to say it in the office, you know? Yeah. So we usually go till just before nine. We've gone over a little bit. Tonight was an awesome night. I had a lot of fun. We had a lot of great conversation and a lot of great clarity from everybody. And Simon Sensen, thank you. You Simon, I hope you'll come back sometime tonight. Yeah, my pleasure, guys. It's, it's not the easiest time with the family for me to get away, but if I can, I will for sure. Love to see you, brother. Yeah, well, guys. you're invited anytime. Everybody is. This Tuesday nights we do uh, uh, at 8 p.m. and uh, holidays were taken off. I'm finally, after four years, we're going to take breaks for holidays. And uh, I love and appreciate you all. Have a great night. And yeah. uh, I'll see you next week. All right. Take care, guys. Good See night. You Thank you, Thank everybody. You. Thank you all.